So um, let me start here with the uh, the overview of what the SBC can do. Maybe you'll learn uh, new things uh, in there. Okay, so I want to show some of the SBC use cases that we propose. Um, then we, I want to go through all the functionalities. So uh, in those functionalities, there are NAPs, uh, the SIP, uh, all everything that surrounds the SIP. So the networks, IP networks, and also uh, the ports and the, the interfaces. A call and mission control in the system, a network address translation, a SIP registration, uh, forwarding, uh, SIPI. I know someone has uh, requested specifically to talk about SIPI. Um, I show you some things about uh, fraud calls and then lawful interception. And then I explain uh, what uh, type of monitoring can be done on the system and uh, what type of remote configuration can be done. And then I spend a bit of time also on uh, explaining transcoding, playing and recording, and also uh, media bypass. So some of the SBC use case, some are very simple. It's just a carrier interconnection. So we, we connect uh, various carriers together. Uh, each one of those carriers can have different uh, uh, SIP protocols, okay? So a SIP trunk using UDP, a SIP trunk using TCP, uh, another one using maybe TLS, and SRTP, one of them using uh, SIPI. Uh, all of these are, are mixed together in the SBC and you can route those calls from one network to another. We can do load sharing, uh, we can do priority routing. So uh, this is all uh, integrated in the Pro SBC. There's some uh, talk about uh, uh, the CPaaS. So this is, this is a communication platform as a service, right? So you can rent the service to do some, uh, some of the functionalities uh, you, you wish to achieve. Uh, so the Pro SBC can connect the public interface of those uh, uh, CPaaS platform. And then the CPaaS uh, makes sure only traffic comes from the SBC. So then the traffic that comes to the platform is protected. Uh, so you can uh, do these types of uh, applications. Okay. Then you have a uh, business service interconnection. So for example, uh, you have your own PBX or you have your own network inside the, uh, your, your enterprise and then you want to uh, have a service like Skype Connect, Skype for Business. Uh, all of them, uh, you, you connect directly to it through the SBC and you can configure this. The, the one that is, uh, has been asked a lot recently is the uh, Teams interconnection, right? And uh, uh, Teams, we will be working on this very soon, uh, this year for having uh, interconnect to Teams. I think uh, there's only a few things we need to adjust in our uh, SBC to be able to uh, interface with Teams. Okay. But we tested the Skype Connect and Skype for Business and that works. Okay. Then there's another use case, which is uh, fraud call, call protection. We have uh, in, been installing a lot of those uh, recently. And uh, the way we integrate, well, there's different ways, but one of them is using a, a fraud protection service that runs on the cloud. And what happens is that we can receive a call, send information to the fraud protection service, and that service can return, yes, I accept the call, or, or no, I refuse the, the, the call. Or uh, what we're working on now is having a score. So we can get a score out of this fraud protection service, and then you can configure the SBC to accept or refuse the call depending on the score. And, uh, or, and or you can send the score out in the outgoing call so that another service uh, further in the path can use the score to decide uh, accepting or refusing the call. So these, um, 
these uh, use cases are on the wiki. Okay, so if you look at the link I have down here, uh, docs.techobridges.com here. Okay, so you will see some of these links in the presentation here that will uh, point to links on the wiki where you can find those, those uh, information. And in those pages, what you have is an overview of what can be done uh, of the dia diagram of that specific use case. Then you have uh, information on that and instructions on how to configure these particular cases, right? And I know that even on some of them, uh, we uh, help you to configure uh, the, uh, devices, the devices here so that you have a better chance of success, successfully integrating the system quickly. Um, and you have to follow this page because we're adding more and more of those uh, use cases uh, on the wiki. Okay. So for example, if you want to have a SIP trunking case, well, you just go here and then uh, you will have all the information on how to uh, create your uh, IP interfaces, your SIP stack, your profile, your network access points, and then your routes. And uh, so you will get all the information on how to do that. And, and uh, I would say recently, a lot of our customers, uh, they, just, they just go and try to configure stuff. And then they come to us when they, they block somewhere, right? And then we can help them to unblock and then they can continue to configure the system. But I think this works uh, very well. Okay, so then this is a, a overview of the functionalities of the system. Uh, you have various protections uh, for uh, one network to another. So for example, we hide information from the incoming call so that any system here internally will not have information about the uh, external system. We protect against uh, denial of service attacks. It also protects against distributed denial of service attacks. Um, if the, there's bad formatting on the calls, they will not be accepted in the system. Um, we can protect against the invalid call or calling format. So either we use the fraud system or we can use other tools that we have developed, uh, routing scripts we have developed inside the SBC so that you can protect against some types of uh, invalid numbering formats. We can block unwanted registration, so uh, different ways to do that, and I will show you that uh, in that uh, registration presentation. And then we can control the, the call rate of an incoming call in the system. Okay, either the call rate, number of calls, number of incoming calls, number of outgoing calls, so all of this can be uh, controlled. Concepts on the system, one of them is uh, network access points. Any one of you that have configured the system uh, knows what it is, uh, but here what we uh, uh, present is for those who, who never work with the system. So you have a, a network access point is a, is a entry point to the system. Okay, so you define how you can be reached on uh, in the SBC. Okay, so for example, you can have just one IP, right? or you can have one IP incoming or an IP range. Right? So then when you want to send a call out, you need to define the IP of the destination here. And if you want to receive calls, then you need to define the uh, incoming IP or a range of incoming IPs. Okay. So then you will be accepting calls uh, coming from all those IPs. So it can be just a single IP like a slash 32 or a subnet like this. Okay. On these uh, network access point, you can use all kinds of SIP, uh, SIP protocols. Uh, 
for example, uh, of course, SIP UDP is the default one on port 5060. So that's how you can figure uh, this interface here. So here also we can choose to be a, a local area network port to reach, uh, for example, a PBX that's inside the SBC. Uh, you can also have one port. So usually these ports are going out to the network and they can also use port 5060, uh, but they can use, for example, another protocol like TCP to connect uh, to a remote service. Like in this case, it's Skype for Business. Sky for Business is using uh, TCP for interconnection. And then we also integrated uh, SIP TLS last year in our systems. And uh, again, you can have here a connection. Usually the TLS is on one interface and uh, the default port for TLS is 5061, but you can configure any type of port you want. We support also the domain names. Uh, so you can have, uh, for example, a destination uh, like uh, vix.tegabridges.com. So this name will be uh, resolved. So uh, when you use a domain, make sure that you configure the DNS in the system so that you can uh, reach a, a domain name server. Okay. And this, for example, is another example. If uh, we, we, when we did the test with Teams, we uh, were using phone.tickerwidges.com and this was using SIP TLS for those interconnections. Okay. The call admission control on the system is, uh, you can control how many uh, calls you want to have simultaneously and uh, the call rate you want to have, a maximum call rate you want to have on the system. Uh, and that's uh, configured per network access point, okay? So per destination or per source, uh, you can decide how many calls you want to uh, have as a maximum. So for example, you say maximum 200 calls from Vixtel, and then uh, the call rate doesn't matter but on 6TEL, for example, you want to force a maximum of 25 outgoing calls per second, okay? So what happens sometimes in some of these carriers, they say, well, if you send more than 25 calls per second, I will drop those calls, okay? So then it, it returns uh, uh, errors. So instead of returning errors, we can control it on the SBC. And then if we reach the maximum call rate on that particular network, then we can switch to another network automatically in the SBC. All right. So we can have a load sharing or priority routing. And then if that route is full, we go to the secondary route. Okay. We can do a network address translation. So there's two types of NAT we can do. One is a local NAT and one is a remote NAT. So what we call the, the local NAT is when DSBC is behind a firewall, okay? So when, we, when DSBC is installed, uh, the WAN port is installed behind a, a firewall, then we need to configure the local NAT uh, configuration. So this will allow the uh, packets that are sent out here uh, to be received as well through the firewall. Okay. Of course, the, the firewall ports still need to be open, but uh, the uh, SIP calls will be able to be uh, received and the RTP also. And then you have the remote netting configuration. Uh, so if the customer is behind the net, then we also have to configure a remote netting option. Okay, again, usually uh, this will tell us how to reach this system. So what is the public IP of that uh, customer? And then uh, for SIP and also for RTP. So there's two, two things to configure there usually. Um, and as, a, as an example here, the local net, when you are, are on a cloud platform like uh, Amazon AWS or uh, Azure, uh, Microsoft Azure, 
then you're always behind the net automatically, right? So the cloud system is always behind the net. Then we have a SIP registration. So uh, we call it the registration forwarding. Um, any uh, SIP register that comes in with uh, the domain name that is configured in the SBC will be routed to a configured registrar on the system. So for us, a registrar is, um, is a network access point that you configure in the system. So you will say, this network access point is a registrar. And when you configure your domain, you will link this domain to the registrar uh, that you have, or the SNAP that is a registrar you have configured. Um, you can uh, have more than one registrar per domain so that if the first registrar is, uh, is busy or, or uh, unavailable, then we can start sending these register requests to the standby registrar. Uh, the SBC itself doesn't support a registrar, right? We absolutely need to have an external registrar on the system, but the SIP registration will be uh, filtered in the system uh, before they are sent out to these registrars, okay? So the um, SBC can do also, uh, well, it's, it does SIP UDP and also RTP over UDP, but it also does SIP TLS over uh, TCP and SRTP over UDP, right? So you can convert from SIP TLS to SIP and from SRTP to RTP, right? So we support both modes now. you can do uh, also uh, SIPI on the SBC. So uh, what is SIPI? It, it's just a SIP message, but it includes uh, SS7 ISOP information. Okay, so what we do is we take the uh, SIP message, we add a new uh, MIME body so usually, you know, on a SIP, there's always a SDP mind body that uh, uh, explains the codecs uh, that are being used and which parts will be used. But then we add a new uh, mind body, which is uh, for SS7 eyes up. And in that mind body, we encode the call, calling number and all the uh, uh, parameters that are, that could be available in eyes up. Okay. And we can do the same thing uh, in reverse. So when we receive the SIPI, we can uh, extract information from this uh, ISAP body to do some, uh, uh, some routing. Okay. And SIPI is very easy to configure. Right? I will show you that uh, later. So one of the fraud call that we have, uh, uh, fraud call prevention, I should say, that we have implemented is with uh, ClearIP. ClearIP is um, a solution from uh, TransNexus uh, here down in the US. Uh, and what we do is we uh, send this uh, information from the incoming call out to this uh, cloud service and a cloud service can return us a, some uh, information. So for example, if it, turn, it returns us a 503, it will be considered an accepted call. And then the call will be transmitted normally here on the outbound service. If uh, the same call is being sent to this service and it returns a 603, then we will say we will decline this call, okay? So the call is automatically dropped, all right? So the answer from ClearIP is very simple. Either it's 503, accept, 
or 603 refuse. Okay. The third option is a instead of returning a 503 or a 603, it returns a 302. So what happens is that when the incoming call is received, it's sent to clear IP, it returns a, a 302. When the 302 is received here, we make a new, we send new information to the CAPTCHA server here. Okay, so that's another service that runs in the cloud. And what the CAPTCHA service does is open a voice path between the user and the CAPTCHA service. And then it asks the caller, uh, please, please press two digits. Like, for example, please press uh, four and six. Okay, so the user has his phone, press four, six. Then the call is accepted and sent uh, on the outgoing leg here. If the user, of course, doesn't enter the right information, then the CAPTCHA service uh, tries two more times and when it has failed two more times then it will say decline and we will drop the call okay so it's a very simple service that's uh, uh, easy to install uh, on the systems and uh, it provides a lot of protection on the information on, on on calls that would come in with the wrong information okay uh, clear IP here, I know you have a uh, access to this service. So you can see which calls were blocked and you can add also uh, more uh, calling numbers you want to block. And uh, so you can configure the system to be more or less, uh, let's say protection, more or less protection on the system. Any questions up until now? It's good. Lawful interception. So uh, what we want to do here with lawful interception is uh, uh, capture calls or record calls, which a uh, uh, lawful enforcement agency would have uh, told us to record, okay? So then what, how we do this is uh, first we load a list of targets that is provided by this uh, LEA, uh, LEA uh, agency. And then uh, it's loaded in the SBC and just waiting for any calls that would be calling these numbers or being called on these numbers. All right. So then when the call comes in, and it matches one of those uh, targets, then the uh, incoming leg is copied out to this uh, system, which you configure, of course, as a destination. And the outgoing call that, comes, that goes out, then the information that comes back here is sent also. Okay, so you will have two paths of data one incoming from the incoming leg and one incoming from the outgoing leg. All right, so then you have two streams being recorded in the, uh, in the system. Once the uh, call is complete, then the SBC will send a uh, IRI record, okay? so information about the intercepted call out to the, uh, to the system. So uh, when we configure this, uh, we need two things. One is the SIP destination of this LEA, and one is the uh, where we send this FTP file or where, where we uh, send this file on which FTP server. Okay. Monitoring. Um, well, the the easiest way, I guess, to do monitoring of the system is to use uh, just a web interface. So uh, you do HTTP request on, the, on our web client on the SBC. And then you can get, with this, you can get uh, status information on the systems. You can get, uh, also you can see the call traces of the systems. Uh, you can, well, uh, 
I will show you in the next presentation everything you can do with this uh, web client. Okay. But that's the first place to look to get uh, status. And then most of our customers also integrate SNMP. So we support SNMP GET. We have our SNMP client uh, running on the system. And you can query uh, all kinds of things on the system. For example, uh, IP interface states, uh, network access point states. You can get uh, how many calls on each of these NAPs, how many calls in total, the call rate. And so there's a, a list of uh, uh, different uh, elements you can get from the SNMP system. We also support SNMP traps. So in some cases, um, for example, um, uh, if there's an IP interface that goes down, it will send a SNMP trap to the uh, EMS system. So uh, as soon as it goes down, prepares a SNMP trap, sends it out to the server, and then uh, you can know that one of these interfaces have, have gone down. So traps are, are events sent uh, from the SNMP client to the server. And then get are just requests that are sent here to get information from the system. And then other things you have on the system is uh, call detail records. Uh, we, I have a presentation on that uh, on day three. And then uh, you can, uh, well, record all the calls that have been through the system. So you can get the uh, information about uh, the quality of the calls, how long they lasted and everything, if you are using CDRs. The, um, for the remote configuration or, or uh, configuration itself, well, we, we, most of the things can be configured through the uh, web interface. So you just connect there and you can configure uh, all your, your routing, your network access points, your network interfaces. Uh, everything is configured through this uh, web interface. And I, I will show you this in a, in a few minutes. Uh, the uh, element manage management system um, can have a, a configuration server. And if you want to use that, then you can use our RESTful API to uh, a, a configure all the system here. So what, what we do here is uh, it's still HTTP requests that are being sent to the web server here, but it's in another format, right? So instead of being HTML, it's using the JSON format. And then uh, we send uh, files or, or lists of data to the web server and then it knows what to configure in the system according to what we have uh, sent there. Okay, And for example, also this uh, API can be used to uh, activate the configuration, change the configuration, copy the configuration. Okay, So you can do uh, a lot of things here and the goal of this is to uh, automate the configuration of the system. And usually it's used for uh, when you have a large number of, of deployments to do. Okay. So I have a presentation on this uh, uh, on day number four. Um, yeah, this I talked about already, okay. Then uh, on these systems, you can have uh, one plus one redundancy. Uh, so it's really a, a, a standby system, right? So you view it uh, as one system and you configure it as one system but uh, if the first system fails, the second one will, the secondary server will take over. Okay. So what you need to do is uh, when you configure the, the, well, okay, so if, if you configure the primary system, so you'll be running just like this here as a primary system and everything will be uh, working fine, okay? 
Uh, then if you want to add another system, then you need to use uh, interfaces to connect to the secondary system. We uh, need to have two interfaces. They're called uh, control zero and control one. So you need to configure those interfaces in the initial configuration of the system. Uh, and then once you have done that, then you can add a secondary SBC here. So you start another uh, identical exam, uh, uh, another identical version of this SBC. And you need to have the same LAN1 interfaces on, that you have on the primary. You need to have also have them on the secondary here. And what happens is that if this uh, primary SBC goes down, then the traffic will be sent here because the IP will have been uh, uh, the IP will have been reconfigured on those interfaces here, and then the traffic will go through the system like this. Okay. So when you configure this system initially, everything is copied to the secondary automatically. All right. So you configure the primary SBC, secondary SBC will have exactly the same configuration. The, um, there will be a switchover if there's some applications that have problems, uh, if the server goes down, if it becomes unavailable, and then the uh, um, secondary system will assume the IP addresses of the, the primary, as I was explaining, okay? Uh, one thing we need to note is that, uh, let's say here you have multiple interfaces, and then here also maybe you have multiple interfaces. If one of them goes down here, well, it will not switch to the uh, backup system, okay? Because we don't know if the uh, failure was here or if it was uh, further away in the network, Okay, so we don't know if the error was done uh, here or here, so it's not going to switch over. It's only if internally in the system here something goes wrong, then it's going to switch over to the secondary system. Uh, we get some questions sometimes. Um, about uh, the cost of this. So when you get a, a primary uh, Pro SBC here, you get, uh, well, you purchase a license to uh, be able to install on this system. And when you purchase this license, you can ask to get also a one plus one a license for a secondary system. And it's provided, uh, it's included in the price of the primary Pro SBC, right? So we just give you another key and you need to use two different product keys for the two systems here. Uh, but the secondary one, there's no additional cost for that. Another way to do, um, uh, redundancy is to have uh, active active uh, redundancy. So then what you need to do is use a, a fully mesh redundancy so that any uh, SIM trunk provider can send to any one of those SBCs, right? So they can do a load sharing or priority routing here. And then the other carriers also need to be able to send to one or more of these SBCs and the applications that you may be running here or the PBXs or, or CPaaS or, or any types of, uh, of application here also need to be able to connect to those two devices. All right? So you just need to uh, make sure your configuration is fully meshed. And if you have that, then that works as well. And the advantage of this here is there's no, no connection between the two systems here, right? The two of them are totally independent. And uh, here I, I need to mention on the one plus one redundancy, this mode right now is not supported on uh, the cloud platforms yet. Okay, so we have it on bare metal, VMware and, and KVM, but uh, we don't have it on uh, the cloud platforms, okay.
Okay, there was a question here, maybe that was not uh, answered for the switchover. Okay, so right now, if we if we do the switchover here, and if the primary SBC fails and it goes to the secondary, we will lose all the calls, but the next call that come in will be accepted through the secondary SBC. All right, so the calls will be uh, accepted here in this system. So it takes a few seconds for the secondary to kick in, uh, take control of all the system and continue processing the calls, but the call will be dropped and it's gonna go, uh, only new calls will be accepted here, okay? So we have a uh, roadmap feature that has been uh, planned for uh, end of this year so that we won't lose any calls in those cases. Okay. So right now for uh, transcoding, okay, let me, let me just mention before, when we talk about, uh, uh, I will talk about performance uh, later on, when we talk about performance, it's always with the RTP passing through the SBC. Because uh, there's some implementation with media bypass that the RTP is not going through the SBC. But uh, when we, we show most of the things we show in the presentation here, the RTP is going through the SBC at all times, okay? Now, it doesn't, by default, the SBC will not transcode the data, all right? So then uh, if there's some RTP coming in the system, and the outgoing leg has the same vocoder, then it's just gonna be forwarded to the outgoing call. If there is uh, RTP to SRTP traffic, and you have RTP coming in here, then the SBC will convert to SRTP and send out to the outgoing leg here. If there is a different vocoder, so for example, the incoming leg has G711 and the outlook going leg has G729, you need to have a transcoding device. Okay? So our transcoding device is a hardware, a physical device based on our uh, media gateway platforms, which then have a lot of uh, transcoding device inside. And what happens is that the SBC will figure out that, oh, well, this call needs to be converted or, or transcoded then it's gonna send the RTP traffic down to the transcoding device and then back out with the G729, okay? Right? So the incoming could be a different vocoder than the outgoing. In addition to this, the uh, transcoding device can also do some uh, play functionalities. So what you can do is uh, store files, WAV files on the uh, file system of the, uh, of the SBC and, and or tone patterns, right? So it can be just recorded tone patterns. And what happens is that when the call comes in and we decide to play, a call, uh, play information on the call, we can have this, these files being transcoded and sent to the incoming leg. So by doing this, uh, you can play any type of file on different types of condition. So for example, you may want to play on uh, a call that is being disconnected. You want maybe to play a file before a call is connected, right? So you can uh, do those functionalities. And you can also play on the outgoing leg, right? So it's either playing on the incoming call or on the, uh, on the outgoing call. Right? So you can control all of this. Some of these uh, play features are configured on the web interface. So you can go and just select when you want to play uh, the information, but there's a good chance that we need to use a routing script to decide which files you want to play when. And so we have some uh, we have some examples on uh, uh, 
uh, on how to do that. Uh, I also did a script recently for uh, detecting digits. So what we can do is when we uh, receive a call here, we can use the uh, DSP devices inside the transcoding to detect digits, right? So we can, we can have customers press different types of dip different digits and being able to detect it in the SBC. So uh, it, re it also requires a script to uh, allow detecting digits. For recording, um, what you can have is uh, record data from the incoming call. So what happens is that when you receive the call, uh, you will answer it and uh, you can have, again, a routing script that will decide if you want to uh, record this call or not. Right? So maybe you want to trigger on a specific uh, uh, information from the SIP header. So if the SIP editor says, please record this call, then you can uh, activate the recording. And what happens is that this will be uh, passed through the uh, recording device and stored internally on the disk. Uh, and then you can retrieve those uh, recordings using uh, SFTP or another method here. You can do the same and record the outgoing leg information, incoming outgo outgoing leg information. Okay. There was one question on the DTMF here. So the DTMF, what happens is that you, when you detect a DTMF digit here, it will be sent to our routing script. Okay. So you can only do this at the, uh, before the call is, is answered, right? So if you do this at the beginning of the call, you can detect digits. You cannot detect digits uh, all the time. Uh, normally, digits will just pass through from the incoming to the outgoing leg like that, okay? But if you want to detect them uh, before the routing is done, then you can do that. And the routing script will capture those digits and you can decide what to do, right? Because the, the routing scripts are, uh, um, configurable language. So you can just get those data and uh, uh, decide what you want to do with them. Okay. And the other question is, do we need to have a hardware transcoding device for call recording? The answer is yes. Okay. So to record, we must, it must go through the uh, device here. Okay. So we do have some, some ideas on, of doing this uh, in software, but uh, for some reason, there's always something more important for us to do. So it's being pushed sometimes uh, down the roadmap. Uh, but, uh, you know, for now, recording works with the transcoding device. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's that? Mm. <laughs> okay. Media bypass. So like I said, in this presentation, I don't talk a lot about uh, media bypass because most of the applications, we want to pass the RTP through the system, but I do have some customers that use it in, in this format. So then only the signaling goes through the SBC. The media goes directly end to end. So there is uh, advantages of doing this because uh, the SBC, of course, can handle much more calls if you don't pass the RTP uh, through it. And you still have control on the routing and you can still do routing scripts and, and these, uh, these things. Uh, on the cloud, for example, well, you use less resources so then it, it's less expensive to run the SBC uh, in the cloud. However, of course, there's some drawbacks of doing this, right? So the SBC cannot protect against the RTP traffic being uh, too much or, or not adapted to the uh, SIP information. Uh, there cannot be any recording, playing, and um, the endpoints need to be able to reach each other 
So they need to be in the same uh, either public or private network. Okay, so, uh, but definitely uh, in some situation, we want to use uh, media bypass like this. Okay. So that's the overview. Any specific questions on that?